temple made by God, not man. Behind the veil, in the place most holy, hallelujah, oh hallelujah, investigating. He's 
Happy Sabbath, church family. It's good to know that God has given us a high priest who's working on our behalf in the sanctuary. Start by saying Happy New Year to everyone. And um, uh, as, as, as relieved as everyone is, that the last year is over. This one has already started out to be a kind of a doozy itself. Um, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, but, um, you know, God is uh, working us through some things. And um, I think uh, it's more than ever a time of preparation for God's church. I think that is what is what, what really is is being impressed upon the people of God, that we are to be preparing for what is coming upon the earth. Um, because there are a lot who will be shaken out as these movements continue to happen. A scripture reading is taken from Ezekiel uh, 37, uh, verses 11 and 12. Uh, then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Verse 12 says, Therefore, prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. O oh, my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Our, our message this Sabbath is entitled From Dry Bones to an Army. From dry Bones to an Army, How to Thrive in 2021. How to Thrive in 2021. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. Lord, I ask for an extra outpouring of your Holy Spirit right now. I pray in a special way right now, Lord, for angels that excel in wisdom and strength to be given charge over this place. Bind the enemy. Remove the distractions. Break the yokes that are upon your people. Father God, as your word is preached, our hearts and minds would be fertile soil for the truth of your word. Now make me once again, Lord, a simple nail upon the wall. Upon that nail, Lord, I ask that you hang a portrait of Jesus Christ. Let Eric Walsh not be seen or heard now, Father. Instead, us, instead, Lord, allow us to hear a word from the throne room of grace. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to come from the book of Ezekiel today. One of the most interesting books in the Bible, in my opinion. Um, one author, described, one author uh, has a book um, I'm trying to remember the exact title while I was doing the research. Um, and basically calling Ezekiel the book of the weird and the absurd. It is a very strange book. Here's a man that doesn't give, he, he's not like Jesus that gives a parable. He acts it out. He goes and lies down next to ants' nests and does all kinds of strange things in this book. He doesn't have normal prophecies like, Four-faced beasts appear and then wheels inside of wheels. And to this day, the people in Area 57 looking for, um, looking for uh, aliens still say that Ezekiel saw, saw a spaceship. It is an interesting book, but it is a powerful and timely book. And Ezekiel 1 sets the stage. And I'm going to give you some backdrop before we get into the part of the book that I really want to highlight um, so that we get to know Ezekiel a little bit better. In Ezekiel 1, and verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass in the thirteenth year 
in the fourth month, and the fifth day of the month. This gives us, most scholars believe, Ezekiel's age. He was about 30 years old. He says, as I was among the captives by the river Kibar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. In the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. So you would remember that in the second wave, I'll show you a, a diagram of this in a second. Um, in the second wave of, of, um, of, of captives being taken from Judah, um, Jehoiakim the king, after only reigning for three months, is taken captive. Ezekiel goes with that batch. And he does, he's not like Daniel who goes probably around ten years earlier. He goes when they're looking for people to work. And so some believe that Ezekiel actually, the river uh, that he's going to, this river Kibar that he mentions is one of the canals and tributaries designed by the Babylonians outside the wall of the city where they grew in a very fertile place, um, grew their food. And Ezekiel, who was a priest in the house of God, is now lowered to the level probably of one who simply lives to dig and maintain canals. But as he is there, don't miss this church, as he is there working by the canal, the Bible says that the heavens open up. And while Ezekiel is doing the monotonous, demeaning work of a slave, he sees a vision of God. He gives us the timing there, and in verse 3, he says, The word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kibar, and the hand, look at this last part here, and the hand of the Lord was there upon him. See, some of you think that you have not climbed high enough in life to be used by God. You think that you have to have some exalted position or some, uh, some, some uh, long years of education in order to be a tool fit for God. Now, obviously, we believe in education. And we know that many of the, the folk in the scripture are quite well educated like Paul. But I want to submit to you that even if life has left you digging canals by the river Kibar, God's hand can be placed on you. Here, e e Ezekiel, beaten and downtrodden, surrounded by 10,000 other captives who are longing for home, uh, they are depressed and hopeless, here they are, and as Ezekiel is wondering what their fate would be, would they ever see Jerusalem or Zion again, my Bible tells me that God opens the heaven. I don't care how dark the day is for you, God still can open the heavens to show you what he has in store for you. So, just to give you some more background, I, I, I love this stuff. Here is the, the story of the life, uh, in a sense, of Ezekiel. You see he's the green bar here. And in about 597, he's a part of the second deportation to Babylon. Um, the first deportation is when Daniel went. So Daniel went um, a few years earlier, seven years according to this chart. Some say ten years, but just he went earlier. They were very much contemporaries. And I have to believe that Daniel and Ezekiel would have known each other quite well, in a sense. There's no way that Daniel and the three Hebrew boys would have been elevated to the top of the kingdom the way they were by the time Ezekiel is brought in captivity and not recognized that the man of God was working where he was working. I believe they probably knew each other. But as you can see, uh, as, as, the, as from Josiah, where with a life where, Je, where Jeremiah uh, started his ministry during this reign, you can see that at this time there was a plethora of prophets. There were so many warning Israel, warning Judah of what was to come, yet the people would not listen. And you can see, I love this diagram, you can see Jeremiah's life here, and you can see um, all of the years, the seven years the Jews are in exile. Here's, the, here's Ezekiel's ministry and Daniel, these are really their ministries, not their life. And you can see that these guys all at the same time are preaching for the people. And here's what's interesting, during the 10 years between Daniel's captivity 
and Ezekiel's captivity, there, ar there arose among those in Jerusalem many, many false prophets, all of whom were saying, don't worry, God is not going to allow this to last long. In fact, one false prophet says we're, there, it's only going to be two years, and God kills the false prophet. Here they are, all preaching a warning that Judah and Jerusalem must repent for their sins. What were their sins? If you read the books of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, and even the, the, the prayer Daniel gives of repentance, you start to see that there is a pattern of sins that really caused the fall of the people of God. One of them is they began to worship the idols of the nations that surrounded them. The other, if you look at Ezekiel 16, is that they began to get proud and neglect the poor and the needy where they were. In fact, the Bible gives us the story of this captivity. In 2 Kings chapter 24 and verse 8, Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned in Jerusalem just three months. His mother's name was Nehushta, the daughter of Elnathan of Jerusalem. And this king, again, did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all his fathers had done. At the time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city, and his servants did, and his servants did besiege it. And Jehoiachin, the king of Judah, went out to the king of Babylon, he and his mother, and his servants, and his princes, and his officers. And the king of Babylon took him in the eighth year of his reign. And he carried out thence all the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king's house, and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord, as the Lord had said. And he carried away all Jerusalem. Look at this and all the princes and all the mighty men of valor, even 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and smiths, none remained. Who was left in Jerusalem? The Bible says the poorest sort of the people of the land. It's interesting. The sins of Jerusalem was, one of the big sins was, they neglected the poor. They overlooked the poor. They vaunted themselves against the poor. They committed usury against them and abused the poor. And when captivity came, the captives must have liked the clothes that the, the people that weren't poor were wearing. They must have liked the way that they, they did their hair and, and kept their skin looking fresh. Because that's who they took. And it was a brutal journey. If you can imagine the wealthy and the royalty of Judah being taken captive, they had to walk a terrible distance, 10,000 at the time of Ezekiel. And they couldn't just cut straight across here because you wouldn't want to walk through a desert. So they had to go up and around the Fertile Crescent, up and around this area, and then back down. And here, you see this here? There's, Lake, there's the River Kibar, way down here south of the of the city of Babylon, which is up here, here is where Ezekiel finds himself. Trapped between the city of Babylon, the sea is actually to the south, the Persian Gulf, and the desert to the other side. It is a hopeless and terrible situation. 10,000 of God's people, leaders, skilled people, are now reduced to servants and slaves. You can only imagine what it must have been like for even the priest Ezekiel. Many say he never got a chance to function as a priest because he was taken captive when he was. There was no temple. But the Bible uh, and the spirit of prophecy give the hint that Ezekiel becomes more of a pastor. Daniel is moved up into a position of privilege and influences Nebuchadnezzar directly. Jeremiah is left behind as kind of the cleanup guy trying to see if he can get them to repent and turn to God for those who have not been taken captive. But Ezekiel gets the almost, uh, in my opinion, maybe the most difficult challenge of trying to keep hope alive among the 10,000 captives. Can you imagine? What sermon do you preach when you're now slaves of a foreign government? When all your life you heard the story of Moses being uh, delivering the people from Egypt or Joshua's victory over the people of the land of Canaan 
How, what, what sermon do you preach now when finally Jerusalem is in ruins and, and, and all that you thought was sacred is taken? The vessels of the very sanctuary have been captured and are now being used by a heathen king. I want to submit to you that they were in a very pickled predicament and it seemed as if there would never be a way out. In fact, one of my favorite psalms is actually a Billboard top, uh, top 100 hit as a reggae song. And don't worry, I won't sing it, but I will read the psalm. This was actually a hit. It's the oldest, actually the oldest lyrics ever to make the, the Billboard Top 100 is Psalm 137. An old Jamaican singer sang, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. Look at verse 3. For they carried, for they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. Can you imagine what it was like for Ezekiel? The psalmist is telling you. Not only were they slaves, they were asked and required to entertain and make them laugh and to sing. It was a hopeless, bitter situation. Verse uh, 4 of Psalm 137 says it like this. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? The psalmist then says, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. In other words, let my right hand lose its skill. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. Let me tell you something. This is prophetic because we are now at the rivers of Babylon. We now live captives in a world that is darkened. And let me tell you, what Satan wants to do is what he tried to do to Daniel and the three Hebrew boys. Uh, and, and they had to push back against in the, in the first two chapters of Daniel. Uh, what he's trying to do is get you to like the things and ways of Babylon so much that you're willing to sing their song in their land. That you're willing to partake in their entertainment. That you're willing to be a part of Babylon. The psalmist warns you, listen, if you forget Zion, if you forget, for us as Christians, as modern day Israel, if you forget the kingdom of the living God, he says it would be better that your tongue got stuck to the top of your mouth. If you prefer the chief joys of this world over that of the new Jerusalem. The situation for them gets tough. And I would imagine hopelessness begins to set in. And for many, as we heard before we had the prayer today, hopelessness is really where much in America is right now. Many in the world are in a place of direct and complete hopelessness. And we'll talk more about that in a second. But I want to make it plain to you that the guy writing this book and preaching these sermons also had to deal with hopelessness. One of the toughest things in the book of e Ezekiel um, is this passage right here, Ezekiel 24, 15 uh, through 18. It says, also the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, behold, I take away from thee the desire of thine eyes with a stroke. Yet neither shalt thou mourn nor weep, neither shall thy tears run down. What is he talking about here? All of a sudden, Ezekiel, the one thing you have left in captivity that you love, the one desire of your eyes is going to be removed with a stroke. Suddenly it's going to happen. Look at this. He says, and you can't mourn. Forbear to cry, make no mourning for the dead. Bind the tire of thine head upon thee and put on thy shoes upon thy feet and cover not thy lips and eat not the bread of men. And look at what happens in verse 18. So I spake unto the people in the morning, and at even, in the evening, my wife died. And look at this last part of it. And I did in the morning as I was commanded. Ezekiel isn't just removed from the position of priesthood in Jerusalem and in the temple. He does not just watch the disgrace of his people as a foreign invasion, invading army 
marches out the smartest and the wealthiest of his land and makes them stand by canals and dig to make sure that their oppressors can eat. Ezekiel is not just suffering the difficulty that comes from being a captive in a foreign land, a hostage against his will, not knowing the fate of his homeland or the rest of his people. Ezekiel is not only hit with all of that, on top of that, the one desire Ezekiel has left in this life, his wife, God warns him, in a stroke she'll be taken away from you. And you can't even mourn. I told you this is a strange book where God asks Ezekiel to act things out. And when you begin to dig into it, the reason for this is God is saying, listen, Judah was my wife. Israel was my wife. And she has been taken suddenly. And God is saying, listen, just as many of you are not mourning what you have lost spiritually because of your sins, just as you are not mourning uh, all that you have lost and all that has gone from you as Judah and as Israel, as the very chosen people of God, God is saying through how Ezekiel behaves here, he's saying to his people, uh, you will not be lamented or mourned for. Ezekiel had it tough. Five years about afterwards, Ezekiel begins his ministry. When Ezekiel starts his ministry at around 34, 35 years of age, uh, Jeremiah, when he starts at 30, Jeremiah is 46, Daniel's around 28 years old. When Ezekiel starts to really try and put the thing back together, he is deep into the time in oppression. And this is where we jump into the verses to focus on. In Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 and 2, is one of the most storied scriptures in the Bible. Ezekiel 37 and verse 1 says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. And caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. When by the time Ezekiel recovers from the loss of his wife and he settles into this thing, one of the visions that he's given, one of the profound visions that he's given is one of dead bones in a valley. The spirit carries him. And here Ezekiel is forced to see this, the, the, the valley of bones and, and all of the death and destruction. In fact, the Bible makes it clear, uh, as we just read in Ezekiel 37 and verse 2, the bones were very dry, making the point that there was no coming back. These bones hadn't just been dropped. They speak to the condition of God's people. Dry bones. Not just dead people now. They're dry bones. They have rotted. They have been corrupted for so long. So many generations of, of, of foul kings. So many generations of idol worshippers. So many generations of rebellion against God. Of the, of the oppression of the poor. So many generations that spiritually God's people were like dry bones. And let me tell you something. Coming out of 20 20 and going into 2021, it feels like we are in the days of Ezekiel and these dry bones. The world has no answer for what is going on. In fact, it seems like the situation Ezekiel is in, that when it seems like maybe something's going to get better or there's something you can hold on to, something worse happens. Let me tell you, look at this is the coronavirus um, Worldwide, uh, I think this is the death uh, graph. The death rates sh sh are up, shooting up. One of my friends is a nurse anesthetist um, that I went to Oakwood with in, in, at the Loma Linda uh, University Hospital where I trained. And he was, I was talking to him this week and he was telling me that it is like a war zone in California with COVID. He said there's so much death all day, every day. It, it's, it's difficult to, to even describe it, he was telling me. And some people still think COVID is not real. I feel sorry for you if, you, if that's what you think. And, and you're not Christian if you don't believe that God is going to allow pestilences. That is what Matthew chapter 24 and verse 7 says. 
This is not, I don't know, and I do not believe it's a punishment. I believe it's a warning for the world and for the church. And I've seen patients with this thing. It is, it is difficult. And some people get it and they brush it off. This mildly ill, few symptoms. Some don't even have symptoms. But the, those patients we see that get sick, mercy. It rattles their body from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet, unable to breathe, difficulty moving, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, every challenge, blood pressure that can't be controlled, ultimately respiratory failure, kidney failure, and if not fixed in time, death. Dry bones of a situation. The whole world am, uh, are embattled by it. And, and of course, when we said, okay, the vaccines are being released, things are going to get better. Then they say, wait a minute, there's a new variant. Just when you thought it might, you, you could see some light at the end of the tunnel. And one of the articles I read this week said, they're not 100% sure that the new spike proteins, which are these red things sticking off of the virus here, they're not sure, because sure that, that's where the mutation has happened. They're not sure that the vaccine is going to be as effective on the variant strain as it was on the initial strain that the vaccine was the, uh, the, uh, um, um, created for. Are you getting what I'm saying to you? That even the hope that they're putting in front of us, now there's issue. And I'm not questioning the vaccine. I'm telling you that based on the science, the virus is mutating. You can see the worldwide cases and deaths. If it was just the virus, if it was just the disease, it'd be one thing, but it is the fallout. Last month, 140,000 jobs lost in the United States alone. And let me ask you this, talking about dry bones and hopelessness. If America is suffering like this, what is happening in the developing world? Anybody really thought about what's happening in Central, South America, Africa, Southeast Asia, the Caribbean? How difficult must life be for those countries that depend on tourism and you know, only a handful of people are traveling now? Dry bones. Macy's, the big uh, retailer, going out of business permanently, I read this week. Over the next few years, they're going to phase out all their stores. The world will never be the same. In fact, I read an article um, uh, um, uh, where they were describing that there are certain individuals and certain forces in the world that view this as an opportunity for a great reset. You see, that's what Nebuchadnezzar was doing. He was going to reset the world. Nebuchadnezzar was going to move people from where they were, put them other places, change the world into a Babylonian image. I want to submit to you prophetically, and I don't have time to get into it today, that what you are watching is are, are certain powers trying to reset the world prophetically. Set the world up to be in a position to receive uh, the mark of the beast in the, in the form of a Sunday law and, and, and do away with our freedom of religion and rights to gather and worship on a Sabbath. I know it sounds outlandish. It may sound crazy to some folk, but if you're reading carefully, many of you this as an opportunity, like Nebuchadnezzar did, to reset the world. Of course, this week, one of the most startling things that happened, we watched American democracy give one of the most embarrassing shows ever. I thought it was fascinating. All of this was going on, and the truth of the matter is, somebody's got to do something about our election system, because the last two elections have been challenged pretty greatly. Or by both sides, which I, I think you can, we can all agree that there's been challenges on both sides. Somebody's got to do something about it. But the idea of violence and pipe bombs and uh, the things that happened this week, four people died, and then a fifth when, the, when one of the police officers succumbed to his injuries. This is America. But my Bible tells me in Revelation chapter 13 that things are going to change in this country. Somehow this beast, meaning this country, this government, this beast that had two horns like a lamb, meaning that it had more of a Christian demeanor, somehow one day it is going to begin to speak like a dragon. One of the ways you get an excuse uh, to control the people is a pandemic. You can, from a public health standpoint, you can put out all the laws that we have to follow. There's one way you can do it. But the other way is insurrection. 
If your government can make the world and the country believe that somehow it must put down a firm fist in order to control unruly mobs, and this has been a year, 2020, up till now, has been a, a time of big protests and, and damage of federal property, whether it was in Portland in that federal uh, justice building there or whether it was in D.C. this week. It doesn't matter. Both sides, and this is why the Adventist has to be clear not to take sides. You've got to understand prophetically what's going on. There is going to be a movement to give government more power. I thought it was interesting. The Confederates... Armies never were able to breach D.C. And this week, the Confederate flag was walked right through the U.S. Capitol. We are in a time of dry bones, church. Some of you have dry bones in your personal life. Difficulties and challenges may be related to this, to this pandemic, may be related to other things, but you're dealing with a time of dry bones. Life does not seem as it is what it used to be. You, you are dealing and facing challenges and obstacles, and, and even in your spiritual walk, things just don't seem right. You are in the valley of the same type of bones. But I want to tell you that I, we serve a God who can take dry bones and make armies. In verse 3, of Ezekiel says this, and he said unto me, God says to Ezekiel, son of man, can these bones live? Ezekiel gives a good answer, says, and he answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. The spirit of prophecy says this kind of shows that Ezekiel may not have been 100% sure of an answer. But as he is in vision, God shows him the valley of dry bones, and I, I believe God asks Ezekiel this question like he's asking you this question. As you look at the world, as you look at the nation, as you look at the church, as you look at your own life, God is asking, as you look at the dry bones around you, can they live? Do you believe that it can get better? Are you stuck in hopelessness? Do you think that it is all over? Do you, your marriage or your relationship with your child, your ability uh, to, to work and feed your family, do you think God has given up, and it's nothing left but dry bones. Well, verse 4, again, he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Now, that's an interesting thing, to preach the bones. Now, you make logical sense if you think about it. There is no uh, acoustic apparatus in a set of bones to hear stuff with. But I want you to get that that is the power of the word of God. It penetrates uh, in, a, in such a way that even if the individual hearing the word of God is not acoustically connected to him. My Bible teaches me that God's word cannot go out and come back void. If his word goes out, even the dry bones. And let me tell you, let me, let me just pause right here and say why this story means so much to me right now. Because there are people in my life that I am fearful have gone so far from God that they won't come back. I am worried. That I have folk I love dearly that I weep over. Let me tell you, I was a sensitive kid in many ways. And I remember I had one aunt who, uh, who I, I, just, I just loved her so much. She took such good care of me. But she would not go to church. And, and, and she continued to do many of the things of the world. Even as a little kid, I could tell. And I remember one Friday night as my mother, she would lead us in these powerful um, worships on, on, on Friday nights. You remember my mom? And we would sit and, and read the scripture. And she would explain to us the Bible stories and then go to the spirit of prophecy to try and make it make sense. And I remember one night we were talking about heaven and how beautiful heaven was going to be and how amazing it would be when we walked the streets of gold. And I began to weep because I was so concerned that my aunt would not be there. 
Let me tell you something. There are folk in your life that may seem like dry bones. It may seem like it's a waste of time to try and reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've been guilty of this, thinking that some are too far to be reached by the word of God. But this story reminded me that in 2021, it is a year that we must preach even to the dry bones. Verse 5, thus saith the Lord God unto these bolds, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. It is prophesied while it's still a bone that it's going to live. Verse 6, God says, and I will lay sinews upon you. And will bring upon bring flesh upon you. If you can see in your in your mind, uh, you can you can actually begin to to paint the picture for yourself. That as God begins to talk in vision, as Ezekiel is, the bones begin to stand up. They begin to assemble themselves in proper order. The vertebrae light line up. The ribs come in and connect around them. The shoulder bones then attach. The arms start to form. The legs attach to the hip bone, which connects up into the vertebra. The coccyx uh, holds the whole swing together, and the, and the bones begin to stand up. As the bones begin to stand up, the connective tissue starts to rise up, and the muscle starts to be laid over the bones, and, and the cartilage finds its place until finally skin is is wrapped over the entire body. And I will lay sinews upon you and will bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So, prophesied, so I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied there was a noise. And behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. All of them were put together, but there was no breath. It was just a body standing there. Verse 9, then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. What's interesting is, God, what God showed me when I was reading this is, Revelation 7 says that there are four angels holding back the winds of strife. And what, what God was showing me is that one of the ways that God turns dry bones into flesh and then the flesh into something active and living because of breath is because God allows them to pass through the winds of struggle and strife. Some of the difficulties you're facing is God allowing his breath to be blown back into you that you might live. Verse 10, so I prophesied as he commanded me and the breath came unto them and they lived and stood up upon their feet. My Bible tells me that in this vision, Ezekiel sees them go from bones to the last part of uh, Ezekiel 37, 10, where it says, an and they became an exceeding great army. So guess what, church? You're not supposed to just stay dry bone. You're not supposed to just get life for the sake of getting life. You get life to become a member of the army of the living God. That is the purpose. That is what we must each find in 2021. Our role in this army. Then he said unto me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they, they say our bones are dried and our hope is lost. Look at that. Our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Verse 12. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves, and cause you to come up out of your graves, and bring you into the land of Israel. Church, I don't care how bad 2020 was. I don't care how tough things are for you right now. God is still in the business of raising folk up out of seemingly spiritual death. Setting them back on their feet. Verse 13, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. Verse 14, and shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. And ye shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. What is God really talking about? He's not just talking about them getting back to Judah after 70 years. He's also speaking that some of us need to be looking forward to the new Jerusalem. God has a place for you in the new Jerusalem. He has prophesied that if you can come in line with him, he has a place for you. There is a chair for you at the welcome table. 
There's a crown waiting for you. A robe waiting for you. God has made a room in his house for you and a mansion in the countryside for you. I don't care how dark it gets, no matter how hopeless it seems. One of the reasons the Bible explains heaven in such beautiful detail as my mother did that night when I cried for, this, for the state of one of her sisters, the reason the Bible does that is so that when this world gets dark, you can look to the light of the future, understanding that God has not designed us to live in a world of pestilences, of pandemics, of, of, of inflation and famine and difficulty and trial. Our God will use the wind of strife to purify our character so that we are fit to sit at the table. Ellen White says it like this. I'm going to read a little of what she says on this passage. The souls of whom we desire to save are like the representation which Ezekiel saw in vision. A valley of dry bones. They are dead in trespasses and sins, but God would have us deal with them as though they were living. Did you hear that? The folk, <laughs> this thing blew my mind I read this. The folk that we think cannot be recovered God says, do not look at them as if they're dead. Speak to them as if they're alive. They are dead and trusted, but God would have us deal with them as though they were living. Were the question put to us, son of man, can these bones live? Our answer would be only the confession of ignorance. O oh Lord, thou knowest, to all appearance, there is nothing to lead us to hope for their restoration. Yet nevertheless, the word of the prophecy must be spoken even to those who are like the dry bones in the valley. We are in no wise to be deterred from fulfilling our commission, look at this, by the listlessness, the dullness, the lack of spiritual perception in those upon whom the word of God is brought to bear. We are to preach the word of life to those whom we may judge to be as hopeless subjects as though they were in their graves. Though they may seem unwilling to hear or to receive the light of truth without questioning or wavering, we are to do our part. We are to repeat to them the message, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. It is not the human agent that is to inspire with life. The Lord God of Israel will do that part, quickening the lifeless spiritual nature into activity. The breath of the Lord of hosts must enter into the lifeless bodies. In the judgment, when all secrets are laid bare, it will be known that the voice of God spoke through the human agent aroused the torpid conscience and stirred the lifeless faculties and moved sinners to repentance and contrition and forsaking of sins. It will then be clear, clearly seen that through the human agent, faith in Jesus Christ was imparted to the soul and spiritual life from heaven was breathed upon one who was dead in trespasses and sins and he was quickened with spiritual life. That would be profound if that was all where, where she stopped. But she doesn't stop there. She turns to us, the church. And not only does this simile of the dry bones apply to the world, but also to those who have been blessed with great light. For they also are like the skeletons of the valley. They have the form of men, the framework of the body, but they have not spiritual life. But the parable does not leave the dry bones merely knit together in the forms of men, for it is not enough that there is symmetry of limb and feature. The breath of life must vivify the bodies that they may stand upright and spring into activity. These bones represent the house of Israel, the church of God, and the hope of the church is the vivifying influence of the Holy Spirit. The Lord must breathe upon the dry bones that they may live. The Spirit of God with its vivifying power must be in every human agent that every spiritual muscle and sinew may be in exercise. Without the Holy Spirit, without the breath of God, there is torpidity of conscience, loss of spiritual life. Many who are without spiritual life have, look at this church, have their names on the church records, but they are not written in the Lamb's book of life. They may be joined to the church, but they are not united to the Lord. They may be diligent in the performance of certain set duties and may be, and may be regarded as living men, but many are among those who have a name that thou livest and art dead. Unless there is genuine conversion of the soul to God, 
unless the vital breath of God quickens the soul to spiritual life, unless the professors of truth are actuated by heaven-born principle, they are, they are not born of the incorruptible seed which liveth and abideth forever, unless the, they trust in the righteousness of Christ as their only security, unless they copy his character, labor in his spirit, they are naked. They have not on the robe of his righteousness. The dead are often made to pass for the living, but those who are working out what they term salvation after their own ideas have not God working in them to will and to do of his good pleasure. This class is well represented by the valley of dry bones Ezekiel saw in vision. You want to thrive in 2021? Here's the thing. Make this a year of humility, number one. There's no such thing as an arrogant Christian. It is an oxymoron. You can't be arrogant and Christian at the same time. This year, ask for God to humble you. Number one. Number two, I want to challenge you to create a prayer journal and plan that you will pray without ceasing, that you will stay on your knees in God. Create a prayer journal and keep track of the blessings. I have a book that I keep, and I don't, I'm not consistent with it, but when I go back and read how God delivered me from things where I thought it was hopeless, keep a prayer journal. Have a prayer plan. Study the Bible with intention this year. Make it your, your, your duty to study books of the Bible like Ezekiel or and Jeremiah and other books that you may often gloss over and not look into. Take the time, get uh, the SDA Bible commentary and go into the word of God and then reference back to the spiritual prop, spirit of prophecy. You don't have to cover massive amounts of information at once, but if you just begin to open his word, just as Ezekiel saw in vision, the breath of God will begin to, to blow and the dry bones will begin to live. One of the things to pray for this year especially is the, is the Holy Spirit itself. To get to know the person of the Holy Spirit. There is a lot of rain that will fall. There's a great move that is about to happen to God's people. We should be praying for the work of the Holy Spirit on our hearts even now. Ask God to make your dry bones live. Then ask him to send you into the valley of other dry bones that they may live. Last thing from Ezekiel, I want to give you these few verses right here. Ezekiel 36 and verse 26. For this new year, Ezekiel says, a new heart, God speaking through Ezekiel, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart of your flesh, and I will give you, I will take away the stony heart of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them and you shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God I will also save you from all your uncleanliness what's deep about this is something that um, Morris Venden says in his um, devotional um, faith that works and this is my last bit of advice for 2021 spiritually what you find is that many of us never gain victory over sin because we spend all our time focusing on the sin. We spend all our time trying to muster the willpower to conquer the addiction, the bad habit, or the character flaw. And so we spend all our time thinking we can muscle through and don't realize, as already read in the Spirit of Prophecy, when we do that, we can leave no space for God to work to do of his own good pleasure. We're fighting the good fight. We're fighting a fight, not realizing it's a fight we can't win. What is the secret? It's right here. You need a heart of flesh. You need God to give it to you. And when God does that, he will cause you to walk in his statutes, keep his judgments. He will make you a, a, a commandment-keeping Christian. As long as you're looking at your sin, what you're going to be is what you're looking at. By beholding, you will become changed. This year, I challenge you to turn your eyes upon Jesus, to look full in his wonderful face, so the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The secret to overcoming, church, is to keep your eyes fixed on him. 
2021 may not be the year when all the problems in the world come to an end. 2020 may only have been an introduction. Things may get very much worse. The global economy could collapse. Things could get worse if these, if these variants keep coming out, they could make vaccine after vaccine and can't keep up. Things could get worse. Where is your trust and hope? Are you standing by the river Kidar, wondering where God is? Are you standing in the captivity that Babylon would have you uh, in, wondering where the God of deliverance is? Are you wondering if the dry bones We'll ever have life again. I came to tell you that in 2021, don't worry about the world. Don't worry about the politics. Don't worry about what they're all doing. You focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. There is victory, victory in Jesus. This is that year, a pivot year. Make your calling and election sure. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. Thank you for the book of Ezekiel. Lord, even with its quote-unquote uh, quirkiness, there are such powerful truths that you have for your people. Lord, even as Ezekiel and Vision saw that valley of dry bones, many of us, Father, look at our lives and just see nothing but dry bones. Help us to realize that you can make the dry bones into an army. Not just give the bones life, you can make the bones an army. Father God, let us realize that you are soon to return. It is time for God's people to stop laying in the valley as if dead, and come alive by the power of the Holy Ghost. Let this year be a different year for us, Lord, as we prepare for your soon return. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Closing hymn this morning is number 530, It Is Well With My Soul. 530, please stand.
heads for the benediction. Father God, we thank you for your word and for your spirit. I pray, Lord, that as we enter deeper into 2021, we would enter deeper into you, into your truth, Amen. into your word, and into your spirit. Amen. As we leave this place today, Lord, let us never leave your presence. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.